Frontier, which is the, the long Pennsylvania border uh, area down uh, between here and Buffalo, basically, um, is a totally different story. And the, the majority of that area has a very weird political situation going on with a lot of the municipal government officials being leaseholders themselves. And so they haven't had this, the same type of success that we've had throughout New York State to ban fracking on a municipal level. Um, almost 200 municipalities throughout New York have either banned fracking or instated moratoria. And three cities in Car Colorado just followed suit, passing ballot measures this past Tuesday. The movement keeps on growing. As you all know, fracking is in the news constantly. Lots of documentaries, including Gasland Part 2, um, you know, just, just having come out. So it's, it's definitely a big, big issue these days in the news. And unfortunately, our president, Obama, is fully behind this. And he's selling this as essentially American intellectual, intellectual property overseas and making sure that the, the global community accepts this as the future of, of energy. Um, now, that might not seem problematic, and we don't have to talk about you know, fracking necessarily right now, but they're working, the gas industry is working on a plan currently to convert, to convert their import terminals to export terminals so that they can sell their product on the world market, where they can fetch a much higher price than here at home because we have such a glut, we have such an excess of natural gas. They've promised the American people that energy independence is possible with fracking, but of course now they're turning their backs and showing their hypocrisy and, you know, just essentially saying, screw you to everybody who, who said, yeah, I support fracking, it'll bring our soldiers home, it'll, you know, it'll uh, give us domestic energy production, and it's all so that they can maintain control over the energy sector. So that's, that's kind of the, the large picture with, with natural gas, which is most of the conventional resources are depleted, so they're resorting to this extreme energy uh, extraction now, which is, which is fracking. So the, the most important thing I think you can do tonight is to listen to these two speakers here, to help democratize the energy sector as you go back out into the world after tonight and start thinking in a different way about what we can do for the future and how we can really decentralize production of energy, especially with renewable energy. So without further ado, I'll introduce our speakers for this evening. Howie Hawkins is a Green Party and Teamster activist in Syracuse, New York, an organizer in movements for peace, justice, labor, the environment, and independent politics since the late 1960s, Hawkins was the Green Party's 2010 candidate for New York governor and received enough votes for the Greens to be the only third party in New York to secure ballot access without cross-endorsing the Democratic or Republican candidates. Which is monumental. He's a member of the Full Employment Council of the Green Shadow Cabinet. Now, Sean Sweeney is the director and founder of the Cornell Global Labor Institute, a program of the newly launched Worker Institute at Cornell School of Industrial and Labor Relations. Sean has worked with unions in many countries on issues of climate change, energy and transport policy, sustainable food and water systems, and economic democracy. Presently, the, the Cornell Global Labor Institute team is working on an initiative called Trade Unions for Energy Democracy, and he just arrived back from South Africa. So he probably has some interesting stuff to talk about. But um, I will turn it over to whoever will speak first. Well, Sean and I are a reduced version of a panel we did down in New York in June at the Left Forum. And the issue we brought up there, which we want to bring up tonight, is, is it time to democratize the energy sector? Is this something the climate justice movement and the left should put as a priority at this time? Uh, we said socialize the energy sector at the left forum, democratize the energy sector. I think those words are synonymous. Um, and the reason why it's 
urgent now is that in an absolutely necessary demand and a necessary condition for dealing with the climate crisis is that we're on the edge of climate catastrophe. And you may have seen that article that Bill McKibben wrote uh, about 15 months ago now in July of 2012. Global warming's terrifying new math. Did people see that or hear about that? Because he pointed out that in order to stay below the two degrees Celsius increase from pre-industrial temperatures, we need to keep 80% of the proven fossil fuels that we now have in reserve unburned and in the ground. And how are you going to do that when they're worth $27 trillion at the prices in July of uh, 2012? And the people that are in charge, the institutions that are in charge, are for-profit institutions, whether it's ExxonMobil or State Oil of Norway or the Saudi oil company. They're, they're in it for the profit. So McKibben noted that we have a global carbon budget to stay below that two degrees Celsius of 575 <coughs> gigatons of carbon emissions between now and 2050. To have a reasonable chance, it's like a two and three chance. I don't like those odds, but that's the chances to stay below that two degree th threshold. And there are 2,795 gigatons of proven reserves. So 565 is about one-fifth of 2795. So basically, we've got to use the 20% that's most easily extractable. That means the non-extreme extraction, non-fracking, non-mountaintop removal, non-arctic and deep well, deep water drilling for oil, non-tar sands. You know, the oil, like in Iraq, you kick the sand and you get an oil well. Um, a lot of that oil is available, and so is traditional natural gas. That's the 20% we can use during the transition. So that raises the question, is there any way of keeping those reserves in the ground if it's controlled by profit maximizing institutions, whether they're state or private owned? They're not going to walk away from that $20 trillion that would be left in the ground if left to their own devices. And since fracking was brought up at the beginning, I just want to point out that I've you know, taken industry figures and calculated the amount of carbon from the gas they say they can extract from the Marcellus Shale. And that alone is more than the U.S. carbon budget, our per capita share of the global carbon budget, to stay below two degrees Celsius. Now there's been an argument, I think the anti-fracking movement has shot this down to a great degree, but there was the argument that natural gas isn't as bad as coal, not as carbon intensive, therefore we should use that in the transition. But uh, just burning that coal will take us past our share of the carbon budget. And that doesn't even talk about the methane released. You may be familiar with the folks up at Cornell that have studied that. It's controversial as to what the impact will be. Depends on how much leaks, how well the wells are monitored, and there's been studies back and forth. But that's a big factor, too. But I'm just talking about the carbon from the Marcellus Shale. That's just, and there's a lot more frac gas out there. So that shows you, I think, you know, uh, how severe and the situation is because that's supposed to be the lesser evil, the uh, shale gas as opposed to coal. Now you raise the question of democratizing the energy sector and it raises some other questions. One is the question of democracy. You can have state ownership or public ownership but without democratic control. Look at the New York Power Authority. Look at the TVA. Look at state oil in Norway which maximizes profits from uh, fossil fuel extraction, including their investment in the Marcellus Shale, um, in order to fund you know, a pretty good welfare state in, in Norway. But is that what you want your uh, public energy corporation to do? So then that raises the question, is it for profit or for public benefit? Is the mission to operate at cost or to maximize public benefit? Maybe you take a surplus and reinvest it in renewables as opposed to maximizing profits. So what's the mission? Is it to provide renewable energy at the least cost instead of maximizing profit for other purposes, whether they're capitalists taking revenues or states funding other things? So profit-oriented state ownership can be about maximizing share value like state oil in Norway. They, that's their mission, to maximize share value. It's 
two-thirds state owned, but one-third of their uh, shares are in the you know, stock markets. And there's also a relation of democratizing and socializing energy sector to other energy demands. I mean, this was a controversy we talked about at the left forum. Uh, what's the relationship between the carbon tax and dividend proposal, where you put a price on carbon and then rebate that per capita to people. It's actually a progressive transfer of income, and it, it raises the price of carbon and creates an incentive to, uh, for efficiency and renewables. Um, but some say, you know, that's uh, not sufficient that we have to go straight to overthrowing capitalism. That's sort of that debate. So I'm throwing out some questions and sort of setting the frame going back to McKibben's numbers. We've got to keep 80% of the carbon in the ground. It's worth $20 trillion. We've got to go away from an energy sector based on maximizing profit if we're going to have any hope of doing that. And I'm going to come back after Sean speaks and talk about some of the public power campaigns because I think not only is it a necessary demand, it's a popular demand right here in New York and around the country. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that after Sean gives his presentation. Thanks, Larry. I'm actually going to walk over here. That's all right, because I've got a few slides to show you. <clears throat> so I was wondering, John, if we could yeah, turn it back on. Oh, yes. Um, I'm just going to actually go through a presentation that I give to unions. Uh, as uh, Dan, in his kind introduction, said, I coordinate a project called Trade Unions for Energy Democracy. And I think it's appropriate to tell that story because I sense by the look on everybody's faces when you hear the sort of, you know, the, the sort of story that Howie has, to, um, has told and we've all read about, it can all very much feel like mission impossible. Like why don't we just like, you know, relax and, and go and watch TV or something. Or, because you're trying to take on the most powerful corporations on the planet. They're the most wealthiest. If you look at the Fortune 500, the top 10 or a dozen, I think nine of them are oil companies. So how do we deal with this? We're up against uh, you know, big opponents here. Um, but what I think I'd um, like to convey is that there are some very significant developments going on in the trade unions globally, about not just climate change and energy, but around the whole issue of economic democracy. What I want to try to convey that a little bit here. Excuse me. So this is um, this project, Unions for Energy Democracy. I'll go into where it came from in a little while, then a little later. Uh, but I want to just reiterate some of the things that Harry said. The business as usual trajectory for energy and emissions is a planetary crisis. I gave this talk to one of the largest unions in the world at their executive board, and they said, "What are you going to talk about?" I said, "A planetary crisis." And they said, don't you have a more uplifting message? <laughs> and I said, well, I'd like to. I said, but we've got to start by telling the truth. And if that's not uplifting, then that's too bad. But we have to be absolutely clear that this is a planetary emergency. And there's no other way of, of, uh, of, of dressing it up differently. The other thing I think we have to be aware of is, an, is that the energy transition is not happening. If you look in the newspapers or you look, like see commercials on TV or you just generally pick up the vibe around renewable energy and the green economy, it's easy for people, ordinary activists and uh, ordinary citizens really, to get an impression that someone's taking care of business and we're going green and all I have to do is make sure the cans go in the right bucket and, or I change my light bulb. That's my role. And I think that's a that's a very that's one thing we can do as activists is to talk to people about the reality that the energy transition to renewables on the global scale and on the domestic scale is not going forward. Now that doesn't mean to say it won't, but we need to be clear about that aspect. And the third one I think everybody in this room is aware of, but certainly not a lot of union audiences are not, is that solutions do exist. They are, yes, systemic solutions in a sense. We're talking about deep restructuring of political economy, but they're also technological solutions. They're available too, and we shouldn't necessarily um, favor one over the other one. They both have a very important role to play. Now, this one, you've all seen versions of this. This is the International Energy Agency, not renowned to be the most left-wing organization on the planet, quite conservative in many respects. They're talking about a six degrees Celsius of global warming by the end of the century, which is about 11 degrees Fahrenheit 
if the present trajectories are allowed to continue. And so they're calling, they're saying that has catastrophic implications for, for the world. So this is, again, not a particularly radical organization talking. This is the fact the figure is a sort of pictorial expression of what Harry um, pointed out. Uh, the two degrees, by the way, I think it's important to note, and many of you are probably aware of this, two degrees is a political figure. It's not a science-based figure. The idea was when the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change started talking to um, heads of state and uh, various climate and environmental ministers around the world, is what was politically palatable. If it was one degree, given that we're already roughly at one degree, everybody's going to throw up their hands in despair and say, we can't do it. But if it was two degrees, then maybe we've got a chance. And they said 50-50. If, if we can keep warming below the two degree threshold, we have a 50-50 chance of avoiding runaway climate change with its various catastrophic implications. That's not a very good deal. That's a Russian roulette gone wrong. That's a kind of a two-chamber Russian roulette option. So two degrees is a political target, not a science-based target. And when James Hansen broke ranks with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change a number of years ago now, he was the one, of course, who said, we are already in the danger zone. We should be at 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide equivalent. Some of this language may be a little foreign to you, but it's basically a much tighter target than two degrees. But even if we say two degrees, then you've got this, five, this $27 trillion of carbon. Another thing Bill points out, which is also worth remembering, is that this carbon may be below the ground, but it's above the ground economically. In other words, the value of the oil companies on the stock exchanges is inflated because of their access to this carbon. So even though it's in the ground, for them it's already making them a lot of money. And that's one of the reasons why uh, it's going to be difficult to get them to move away from it. Now, Anybody in this room who just heard the, the comments about fracking will know that extreme energy, unconventional fossil fuels, are on the increase globally. This is not just fracking, of course, shale gas, it's tar sands, it's uh, mountaintop renewable. They're finding developing new technologies to get it stuff that wasn't cost effective to get at in the past, and they're pushing it through with, in a very aggressive way. This is obviously a picture of the tar sands in Alberta, where something like 27 billion barrels equivalent of oil is sitting up there waiting to be sucked out of the ground. Uh, so extreme energy um, is on the rise. This also should put to rest the idea that we're in a period of peak oil, peak coal. The idea that it's sooner or later is going to run out anyway, so we really don't have to do very much because it's going to get too expensive and we've got to go green. That was a message of several years ago. That is not the message now. The message now from the coal, oil, and gas industry is we have abundant supply, you know, we can do, get this stuff out of the ground, and it's going to be a great economic miracle for the U.S. The third age of carbon is what uh, they're talking about. So this is uh, obviously um, a factor. So it's all bad news up until now. Globally, going back to this issue of transition, the, what is happening is the demand for energy, the use of energy, is going up very, very fast, something like 3, 4, 5% a year. So what's happened is you see renewables are growing. This is an investment figure, I believe. Renewables are growing. So when you look at renewables in isolation, it looks like a spectacular growth, something like a 4 or 500% increase, for example, in solar photovoltaic. So solar is growing 500% in, in as many years, in five years. You can get this impression that, wow, it's all going to be green from now on. But what's really happening is because renewable energy is starting at a very, very low level, 1%, 2%, 3% of supply globally, if you double, triple it, it's not going to have much difference if the, if the demand for energy continues to rise. So that's, um, that's got to be factored in too. What was the difference between gross and net in that previous slide? Fossil fuel, not fossil fuel. Uh, that's a good question. I actually don't remember oh. the answer. Once uh, Six months ago, I knew the answer to that question. I'm afraid I don't know it now. Um, now, the other feature that's not often, when the climate and environment and energy is discussed sort of in a technical way, we forget the sort of repressive nature of the industry. Globally, it, there's a major shift going on 
from the developed countries with fairly high living standards with unionization rates to countries like Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Mozambique. This is where all the new energy is being found, Colombia, Kosovo, with highly repressive conditions, lots of attacks on workers' rights, uh, and, and even massacres of workers in, in, in a number of instances. Don't have time to go into that now. But it's certainly, um, it's certainly um, another part of the equation. The other thing about the present global energy system is that the levels of people without uh, access to electricity continues to rise in absolute terms. In relative terms, it's, it's falling, but there's still something like 1.4 billion people on the planet who don't have access to electricity. What does this mean? It means they burn wood, cow manure, or they use kerosene and other highly uh, carbon intensive uh, products. So they're buying diesel oil and kerosene, which is a climate uh, disaster as well. So there's higher, high levels in particularly uh, sub-Saharan Africa, India, other parts of the world which don't have access to electricity, despite all this electricity and, and energy coming into the system. These reds here is renewable energy below 5%. And as you can see, there's only a few countries. The yellow ones here you can see uh, in this region here, and New Zealand are in between 10 and 15% renewable. Spain, Italy, uh, Iceland is something like 70% renewable because of geothermal energy. The rest, the, the parts of the map that don't have a color, we don't have the data, but you can pretty much be sure they're all in the red zone as well, which is below 5%. So energy transition not happening. Now, some people have talked in terms of other low carbon forms of energy. The nuclear power industry has promoted itself as a climate solution. And uh, talking about new, a new generation of reactors, what they call, I think, I think they're called pebble something reactors or type four reactors. I don't have all the technical knowledge to help you with that. And then there's carbon capture and storage or clean coal, the idea that we can separate carbon out at the point of combustion and then bury the residue under the ground or under the sea. That's what they call carbon capture and sequestration or storage. Now, what I say to unions is a lot of unions who support this. They feel this is the way they can carry on being in the coal industry or they can carry on being in the nuclear industry. There's a lot of jo union jobs in those industries. So, the, the data I put out is that nuclear continues to fall as a percentage of power generation globally, and with Fukushima, the fall is accelerating. And also with carbon capture and storage, that basically the industry never ever put any money into it. They always wanted government money to go invest in these pilot projects, and about 10 of them last year alone were cancelled, which leaves about 20 going. And they're years and years away of anything up to commercial scale. So carbon capture is not going to come to the rescue and neither is nuclear power even if we wanted it to. So on the more political front, this is a headline from The Guardian. 70% now, 69.6% of Britons polled last week want renationalization of energy. Not because of climate change, but because of the, of the basic rampant profiteering in the industry. In countries like Slovenia and Bulgaria, governments have fallen over energy prices. They privatized it, the companies come in, they jack up the prices, people can't afford to live, they can't afford to turn the lights on, pay for heat, and then you have major battles. The Scottish trade unions have called for the renationalization of energy in Scotland. So you're beginning to see a pushback, again, not really around issues of climate or emissions, but more around the role of the private energy corporations. Now, to the unions, I'll just spend a few more minutes on this if that's okay. This was a resolution, uh, I've been following the debate, been quite actively involved in the debate with the unions on energy. And for 25 years, it was basically a defensive, we were in a defensive formation. Privatization was going forward at, at rampant speed. The best unions could do was try to resist it and get what they could out of the deal. Now we're seeing increasingly the demand for um, of, of renationalization, of, of taking back into public ownership uh, the energy sector. This was a resolution that was passed by 400 unions at the Rio plus 20 talks. I was in the room, it was a pretty electric situation. Um, realizing that the green transition, the green capitalist um, uh, methods, if you like, of trying to transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy it was basically failing. Now, 
This is this is uh, this is part of the project. We got a um, trade unions for energy democracy. Is out of the Rio meeting, there was a group of unions came together uh, in New York. We had a global roundtable and said we need to start putting together a vision for a new energy system. As how we pointed out, this is not as simple as oh, let's take it back into public ownership. 60% or 70% of oil in the world is already uh, uh, basically operated by state-owned corporations, but they behave like private corporations. So Stat Oil, Escom, Sinopec in China, all of these big corporations are public formally, but act like multinationals. They're out there, they're publicly traded, they're trying to make money. So the goal was to bring unions together to start to develop an analysis. This is what we developed. It was called Resist, Reclaim, Restructure. I'll just summarize it briefly what we're trying to do. Resist is basically trying to address the problem of carbon lock-in. This was pointed out in the International Energy Agency's annual report, saying if we don't basically be carbon-free in terms of the infrastructure, we're going to lock in carbon emissions now for the next 30, 40 years. So when you build something like the Keystone XL pipeline, that pipeline, the life of that pipeline is going to be 50 years minimum. That means that's carbon locked in, locked into the system. The same as new of all is true of all new fracking going on, all new infrastructure, all new coal-fired power stations, whether they be here or internationally, is locking in emissions for decades ahead. That's got to stop, and it's got to stop pretty quickly. So resist is what we got to do, and that is what many people in this room are very familiar with. Reclaim is also important. As, as mentioned earlier, the public sector is not necessarily the solution. If you're behaving like a private multinational, if you've been marketized, liberalized, profitized, then the goal has to be to reclaim into the public sphere for producing energy as a public good, not as a commodity for private profit. Big, big challenge, but we've got to acknowledge that it's necessary. The third, I think, is the most hopeful, is the restructuring. Because one thing about renewable energy technologies is that they do open up the doors to community and local control. We don't have to have forever centralized mass-based production of energy. There's a much, much more potential now for on-site generation. In fact, some people say it could be 100% of all energy needs within 20 years if only we wanted it to be so. So there's a, there's a hopeful sign there that communities can use the technologies or the technologic of renewable energy in order to democratize the system from below, which gives us an opportunity to really uh, do something on the grassroots level. So this is the, the kind of the trade union uh, form or framework that we're working on, this history claim and structure. Who's involved? Basically been in the last year going union by union explaining, giving this presentation, explaining what it's all about, why there is a planetary emergency, why the energy transition is not going to happen unless we democratize the energy system, and are you interested in being involved? If they say yes, and they're willing to make a formal decision to be involved, they're involved. And that's the way it's working at the moment. You'll see here, Public Services International, uh, oil field workers of Trinidad and Tobago. This is the National Union of Metal Workers in South Africa, the largest union in Africa. Utility workers right here in the US. These are the workers at Indian Point, by the way. <laughs> National Nurses United, probably the most left-wing union in North America right now. Unifor is a new union from Canada. that was uh, the, a marriage between the Canadian altar workers and the communication energy and paper workers, opposes the Keystone Pipeline. Canadian Union of Public Employees, and so on. So. I don't want to exaggerate it, putting a logo on a website or agreeing to participate does not change the world. But we're beginning to develop an analysis, a strategy, and with building alliances with other social movements, with communities, the unions I think could be at the hub or at the center really of a movement for energy democracy. They won't be able to do it on their own, no, no, no way. But we have unions in India, the Philippines, as I said, South Africa, Switzerland, who are beginning to engage. So there's hope that we can put together a, um, an, a, not just the analysis, but also a political strategy to give it some chance of, of, of happening. I just saw it, I'll close on this. There was um, 
uh, an ad came out from the British trade unions today, it's a video, one and a half minutes long, said renationalize the railway system. I don't know if anybody saw it, I put it on my Facebook page. It's a brilliant one and a half minutes of why the railway system went down the toilet. And the first comment I got on my Facebook page was, we should do the same for the six energy companies in Britain, all of whom are multinational companies that now control the British energy system. Ex climate change, clean economy are not, is not going to be the only message here. It's about control and it's about you know, fairness, it's about jobs and it's about true sustainability. So I think there's a reason to be hopeful that you know, we, could, we can do something here and if, if people want to find out more about it, I'm happy to share information. Thanks for your time. I think I'm handing it back to Howie now. Sorry if I went on a little bit. Too talked about why democratizing the energy sector is a necessary demand. Uh, I want to talk now about why it's a popular demand. I mean, there's reason to believe we can get people excited about this. Uh, in fact, we had a well-developed model in the 1970s. Um, I was involved in the Clamshell Alliance and the anti-nuclear movement at that time. And I'm going to talk about things we were talking about then. Uh, but before I do that, I want to note that Right now, we have about 2,000 uh, public power systems in the United States. Most of them are municipal, some are cooperative, some are regional. But we have over 50, something like 55 in New York State. I'm not that familiar right here in the Albany area. I know up in Syracuse area, in our county, Onondaga, right next to Syracuse is the industrial village of Salve, which is they have no more room to put factories in there because they have municipal power and the power costs one quarter of what we're paying across the street in Syracuse. And then the richest town in the county, Scanty Atlas, down there, Ithaca, has public power and those rich folks like socialist power just fine because they have low utility rates. And that came out of a struggle when we started setting up electric utilities. The question was whether they'd be publicly owned or what we call IOUs, investor-owned utilities. And in some cities like Los Angeles and Cleveland, they went public. In others like my city of Syracuse, they left it to what became Niagara Mohawk and then what we call National Greed, which is National Grid, the formerly uh, public energy company in England, which Thatcher privatized and became a global utility. And uh, so these things are around. So we're not talking about you know something that we haven't done here before, but in the 70s, when the energy crisis hit in 1973, uh, people started talking about what are our options. And models, there was a model developed for public ownership. Uh, one of those model pieces of legislation was for a state energy act uh, designed for uh, states around the country. And it was published in the congressional record by Democratic Senator from Montana, Lee Metcalf. No Max Balk is he. <laughs> and uh, it's a, now all, everything I'm going to show you is on my. I just ran for city council. It's on the, my council website just because I can put it there. If you go to position papers and look under socialize the energy sector, everything I'm just going to show you, you can find there either as a link or as a PDF. So anyway, this is how you could do it at the state level. Um, and at that time, people down at the Institute for Policy Studies, journalists Jim Ridgway, Len Rodberg, who's been involved in talking about a pub national public health service and then single payer later and teaches down at Queens. He was on our panel down there in New York. He and uh, Ridgeway and others, Bettina Connor, developed uh, a national model for how you could take the state model and make it go national. It was published in a couple books, which you can find on the website, National Energy Plan, and I'm going to describe it here in a minute. But that was widely discussed in the anti-nuclear movement. Even before we occupied the Seabrook nuclear power site, we had a thing called the People's Energy Project with the Grand Estate Alliance in New Hampshire. And we were starting to talk about public power and getting a lot of response from people. By the end of the 80s, when we had that second energy crisis in 79, you know, this is the cover of uh, The Village Voice, an article by Len Rodberg and uh, one of the other authors, that the uh, Jeffrey Stokes at the Village Voice, and they did a plan for uh, how to go green and clean and cheap 
in terms of affordable energy in New York City to municipalize the energy system there. And uh, this whole document, I mean, you may have a, a, later, a later version of this. That's the latest. Okay. Yeah. You can get the link to that too. This is Sean's document. So, I got to drop the <coughs> That's okay. Right. All right. So, what came out in the 70s was a model. Sean talked about how if we socialize or democratize the energy sector, it doesn't have to be a big centralized bureaucracy. It can be a federated structure. That's exactly what the state model energy plan developed, and then they took that and went national uh, with, the, with those books that came out from Jim Ridgway and his co-authors. And their model first sort of set out six principles for the mission. Natural resources are the commonwealth of the people. You know, the traditional justification, of private, justification for private property is your labor created it, you get to dispose of it as you want. You can actually argue, make an argument for socializing the profits on that, but that's another discussion. In any case, the resources in the ground, nobody made those, they were there. So that's the first principle. Second principle, every citizen has a right to their fair share of energy. That's the equity question. It should be rooted in local democratic control. It should be transparent, information public. That facilitates a democracy. It should be the least cost affordable energy so prices are at the minimum level consistent with the cost of production and environmental protection. And it should maximize efficiency and conservation of energy. So these are the things we talk about today as green energy. They were talking about that in the mid to late 70s. And basically the structure was a three-level structure. You have the local district, which would be basically municipal, and then a regional district, which would be a multi-state district, and then a national uh, district. The local district, and there would be several hundred of them around the country, would be like the uh, public util utility districts in several states. Um, the board would be elected at public elections. It would be powerful, it would have the power of eminent domain, but not to tax. And it would do the detailed planning of energy and transportation systems within their district. And then the regional boards would be elected by those local boards. And uh, its main purpose would be to plan and allocate resources within the region. And then the National Energy Board would be elected by the regional boards. It would be the trustee of the nation's natural resources related to energy. And it would plan and allocate the resources among the regions for distribution to the local public energy districts. And it would have a planning staff that would serve as the research and development center for the whole system. So I'm not going to go into all the details of this system, but the point was, in the anti-nuclear movement, we were talking seriously about this and trying to gear up public power campaigns. Um, and while we were doing that, there were others, like in Messina, New York, where there's an aluminum industry that, in order to keep it there, needed cheaper energy and went into a big fight with Niagara Mohawk, and they won and saved themselves tens of millions of dollars in the subsequent years by municipalizing their energy. Uh, a number of other things have happened in this period. Um, I've got my list here somewhere in my notes because I'm trying to condense. Here we go. Uh, the Sacramento uh, Municipal Utility District, which was a public power system in Sacramento, California, voted in two referenda uh, to shut down the Rancho Seco nuclear power plant because nuclear power was becoming problematic. That was in 1989 and they moved toward uh, efficiency and renewables. Uh, we have recently a North Country Power Authority set up um, amongst about two dozen small townships in northern New York in, in the St. Lawrence Valley where you may recall in that congressional district the Tea Party candidate ran the Republican candidate off the ballot, basically, and ended up losing. There's a Democrat up there now, but there's, you know, it's a right-wing area. It also has some liberal university towns. These folks got together because of their problems, not only with the rate shock we had in the mid, what do you call it, about 2005 period, um, but also because of ice storms up there, and it took National Grid and Niagara Mohawk before that weeks to get the lines back up. So they wanted to control their own system. And they did finally get the state to authorize the North Country Power Authority. Um, they've, they've had problems the last couple of years because the law firm they asked to help them set the system up, you know, get all the legal uh, 
I's dotted and T's crossed, went bankrupt and then build them anyway and there's a whole legal mess going on. So they got stalled. But the point is, in that community or that set of communities, which are pretty conservative, you could raise the demand for public power and people would take it as a practical alternative. At the same time, the uh, Akwesasne St. Regis Mohawks kicked national greed out and are setting up their own municipal system. Um, Doug Bullock didn't make it here, but I know he's been working on something about a municipal power thing through the county on Green Island, which he knows more about than I do. But, um, you know, that's something that's a live option right here. In Syracuse, when we had the rate shock in 2005, uh, despite a lot of resistance, we were able to get a public power study funded. Unfortunately, the mayor then tried to twist it into a private contract with Siemens to sell power back for biofuels to the city and schools only, not the residents. So the council pulled the funding and, you know, now the line from the Democrats in the city is, oh, we tried that and showed it didn't work. They never did the study. But the fact that we even got the money authorized was because people wanted it. It's an issue that we raised in a number of election campaigns. Um, recently in Boulder, Twin Cities, Santa Fe, Winter Park, Florida, Thurston County, Washington. There have been referenda to set up public power systems. They all want to set up Thurston County, Washington. I understand, I was just hearing from Sean that they had one yesterday or this week in uh, Colorado for the Boulder, yeah. Yeah. Excel. Excel, yeah. Excel, which I have been reading about. They decided to skip over natural gas and go straight to wind and solar because the prices are coming down so fast. So, um, and then in Massachusetts, there's the Massachusetts Alliance for Municipal Electric Choice, which is trying to repeal a century-old law that gives National Grid the uh, veto power over setting up municipal power. So uh, there's, there's a lot of movement around these issues, and it's already something that a lot of communities know about. And I think where we want to go is to link up these municipal power campaigns with projecting the vision of this federated model of uh, public control of our energy sector. Local public utility districts like our municipals, federated at the state or multi-state level so you can plan regionally, and then from there to a national level which can support the whole system. It's a bottom-up structure, and that's how we get, or how we solve the problem of right now the energy industry is for profit, 60% is state-owned but it's not popularly controlled and it's for profit, not for public benefit in the way they've set up their missions. Like I was describing Norway system and you can go through any of this state owned system pretty much. So I think, you know, that's what's before us and you know what we're hoping is as we, you know, get into future election campaigns that this becomes a real debate. Um, in New York State, in fact, going up to that municipal power where they got the problem, one of the things holding up it was, there's a, the, the organization was called the Alliance for Municipal Power among these two dozen towns. And they got the North Country Power Authority authorized by, went through the state senate, I think Patterson was in there when they signed it. Um, and then when they had a dispute with this law firm that went bankrupt, one of the members resigned and now they can't get a quorum to do any more business. And the way it was structured in the law, Cuomo has to approve the people they nominate, and he's been sitting on that, so they're like stuck. So, it, you know, there are issues already that need to be raised at the state level in, in, in the case of that group up north. Um, but, you know, maybe what we need to do is say that the New York Power Authority should be democratized, controlled by local public power systems. They should be linked instead of, right now, NYPA provides cheap hydropower to these municipals. They have first access to it, along with some of the industries, which is a way of keeping factories and, you know, what we got left upstate uh, here, and, and talk about how to expand that system and really get serious about going renewable. And here's the last point I'll make, and this document is also in that, on my website. Uh, you may have heard that uh, a consortium of uh, academics, including Howarth and, uh, and Graffia at Cornell, uh, Jacobson at Stanford and his co-author Deleuze Delu at at UC Davis, they, they did a global study just to show technically it was possible to go fully renewable, wind, water, sun, wave, and water power. No, you don't even need to burn biofuels to provide our power needs, the power 
an electrified transportation system and uh, heating and cooling, including geothermal, which is basically stored solar ground. I'm talking about geothermal heat pumps, shallow things, not the deep stuff that gets down to the, you know, like they do it where in Iceland and, you know, near Geyserville in California and so forth. Um, they showed that this was technically feasible and economical to do within two decades globally. And then they adapted that, that model to New York State and said the same, came to the same conclusion. I mean, what I think we need to do is say, how are we going to implement that model through public power? I mean, the slogan we were using in the 70s, I think, is still relevant. is solar power through public power. And uh, so hopefully out of this meeting and other things we're all doing, uh, we can start building a movement around energy democracy in New York State. And with that, I think it's time for questions and answers. Yep. Before I forget, I um, just want to make sure that people get a, an opportunity to make some announcements about future events coming up. So just feel free to raise your hand and I'll go around the room. Any event? So we'll move on to the question and answer section. Again, just please raise your hand if you have a question for the speakers. We've got Tom. Yeah. Can you talk about what the renewable energy uh, possibilities are in the city of New York? The reason I'm asking is because there's a Blackstone group called Transmission Developers Incorporated, and they're proposing to build a direct current power line from the Canadian border to Yonkers downstate. We can down Lake Champlain, and then Saratoga, Schenectady, and Albany counties will come along the railroad right away, so right down here to Boulevard and Schenectady City, and then back into the Hudson River in Cleveland, and then down to New York City in the Hudson River. And the power would come from rivers in Quebec that are being destroyed. It's not like in the Niagara Falls River where you have a power plant where there is a waterfall, but they're creating these giant reservoirs um, with a series of dikes and there's pounding areas like this, the size of a county. And uh, there's a public hearing on it next week. And I'm opposed to it, but I'm trying to present the idea that not only is it stupid to destroy rivers, but that it's stupid to be bringing in more power from a thousand miles away I think there's a lot of solar power potential in New York City that could be developed very quickly. And I just wonder if you could speak to that. Should we take a couple more questions and then we'll come back? Sure, we can do that. Anyone else? Just feel free to raise your hand. Pete? What if you talk about uh, LIPA and the problem of uh, LIPA as a public power authority? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was in my notes. I skipped that part. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? We'll get one more for the speakers to think about and then we'll tackle them. Anything at all? John. Yeah, you, Sean, Sean, you said that, well, peak oil is no longer an issue. I don't know that I totally agree because I think that extreme energy is a response to peak oil, basically. And, and uh, I just read an interview with Richard Heinberg, who wrote the book, famous book, Party is Over, and he's not really backing off from that book. He points out, for for example, that fracking is is uh, very quickly any any frack well exhausts for very quickly. There's nothing that's going to. He said, it, I think maybe by you might get a bump for, till 2017, and then psh, down it goes because they deplete. So I mean, really, we're still facing. It's not that you can be complacent that well peak oil is happening and it's going to run out and we don't have to worry about it, but it's. But what's happening now, you know, drilling in the Arctic and 10,000 feet in the sea and, you know, tar sands and mountaintop removal are extreme responses to the fact that the easy energy is gone, uh, which was what peak oil was really all about, not that it's going to ever run out. <clears throat> One more right here in the front. Um, I guess what you see as the, if we're going to give the elevator talk to people, what you see is the concrete steps. Uh, in your, you know, you're pretty knowledgeable about it to try and move something like this forward. Okay. I'll just try to take out John's question first. Um, my, my understanding is that, that yeah, the age of easy kind of fuel is, is winding down, that there are just not going to be that many more Saudi Arabias. But um, what the 
International Energy Agency is saying, saying and the Energy Information Agency and all the, um, the, the data that I've been reading anyway is that the technologies have improved to get at stuff that wasn't easy before. But at the end of the day, because the demand for energy is, is so robust at the moment because of the developing world, the China's, India's, Brazil's of the world, that the price is, is, uh, stays high. Above a certain price, tar oil, tar sands oil is not economical. I think it's $79 a barrel. But if it goes above that, it becomes economical. So, you know, the, all the industry projections are that it's going to stay above that. And that's what drives the technological innovations to get at things like shale gas and so on. Except what John's saying about shale gas. I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that you're just going to have to keep drilling and drilling and drilling, and the harvesting goes down pretty quickly. I think that's been the experience um, um, on, on that issue. But again, the coal supplies in the world are also worrying. Uh, the International Energy Agency, in its 2013 report, said there was a trillion tons of economically viable coal on the planet, new supplies of coal being developed. So um, I'm not saying I, there's a complete yes or no to this, but there's certainly a strong case um, or strong data that points towards, you know, that, yeah, it may run out, but it ain't going to run out soon enough uh, in order to, you know, to stop us cooking the planet. Um, so that's the general kind of message that comes out of it. Uh, just real quick on the solar potential in New York State. This is something that Jacobson, New York City, New York City. Yeah, this is some of the Jacobson report takes on. Uh, they basically, this is the report Harry referred to, um, that to be 100% renewable by 2030. And also the NYSERDA did a climate action plan for New York State based on a science-based emissions reduction target. And they pointed to some pretty high potential for rooftop solar. In, uh, in New York City. I don't have, I'm not knowledgeable enough to tell you the, the whole picture, but it's definitely in the Climate Action Plan on NYSERDA's website. Um, and Jacobson puts a lot of stock on actually offshore wind, 40 gigawatts is an enormous amount of offshore wind potential. And he's a little less gung ho about solar, about district, what they call on site um, generation. But it really depends who you talk to. Some people talk to higher potentials than others, but it's very, very significant potential. That's one thing. Plus, the technologies now are such that the sun doesn't really have to be shining that brightly to get some pretty good uh, returns. You know, new kind of um, uh, new sort of uh, PV materials and so on are very so that you can literally have a cloudy day and still be generating power. So all of this gets factored into the to the scenarios, um, but there are different ones for different different studies. I'll let you take up the question again. All right. Um, well, on the renewables in New York City, it's fun to go back and read this. Some of which we'd agree with. Solar, wind, see what they thought was possible in the 70s. Some we may not, like garbage incineration as a renewable source. Uh, energy audit sufficiency, what we call green jobs. They didn't call them back then, but they're talking about the job potential and public power. And then the Jacobson study, another mm -hmm. thing that they put a lot of emphasis on, given that they're near the coast, is tidal and uh, wave generators. Um, and there's actually some of that going on in Hudson River, um, or is it the East River? Anyway, they're, they're beginning to experiment with that, with that now. Uh, on LIPA, yeah, LIPA is lemon socialism. It's uh, exactly how not to do it. NIPA went broke because they built the Shoreham Nuke stubbornly without having an evacuation plan. And even the NRC said you can't evacuate people on Long Island in the event of an accident. You can't run this thing. And then they tested it and made it radioactive so it couldn't be converted. I mean, they just set themselves up for failure. Mario Cuomo had to come in and bail them out. They set up LIPA, which is a not very democratic power authority. And now they've had trouble recently. So Andrew Cuomo's come in and basically uh, kept the good assets to privatize and taking responsibility for the bad assets. So the public gets stuck with the bill again. Um, that's what happens, I think, because of the lack of democracy. Democracy is no guarantee. But without it, we got no, you know, ability to influence. So, I think in a nutshell, that's what happened with uh, Long Island Power Authority. Um, on the peak oil thing, I, I think I agree with Sean that whether or not, for various reasons, cost and so forth, we're going to peak at least with some of the fuels. I think with coal, we got plenty. Um, we got more than we want to burn. 
uh, more you know, can be easily extracted aside from the extreme. That's about the, the easily extractable stuff is almost getting us to that two degrees Celsius, which um, I think Sean made an important, important point. That's a political uh, number, not a real number. And um, the, the Russian roulette thing, the two chamber, I, I thought it was one chance in three, one chance in two. I get the numbers mixed up, but it's not good odds. Um, that's why you know some of the countries went down to uh, Bolivia and said we want one degrees anyway. Um, the other point, I'm thinking when Sean said 350 parts per million, that's the number that Hansen came up with. You know, we hit 400 parts per million last year. So, you know, we got to start thinking about not just uh, reducing the carbon emissions, but expanding the capacity to absorb carbon, uh, you know, by reforestation and, and other measures. And uh, carbon slowly degrades and can be absorbed. So, um, the other thing about that is, you may have seen Al Gore recently got together with former chairman of Goldman Sachs and said, investors watch out for the carbon bubble. Because if things like carbon taxes come in, you're not going to be able to make as much money in your fossil fuel investments. And uh, the question about fracking wells, you know, basically they run good one or two years and then maybe they're, they're exhausted, you know, six to eight years, five to eight years. Um, and a lot of these companies have gotten deeply into debt in order to get into the industry and they may not be able to get their money out. So some of those companies may be collapsing. There's a lot of volatility there. This idea that, you know, this cheap natural gas is going to, you know, give us an economic boom is questionable, uh, if nothing else. And then uh, the net gross thing on your chart, yeah. that may be gross is how much energy the whole economy expends. The net is what you got left after you use energy to get energy. And the problem with extreme energy, it takes more and more energy to get the energy that's hard to get out and then use for other purposes. So the net, is, the net as a proportion of gross is shrinking as we go to these extreme energy extraction uh, forms. So that's, I think, the kind of thing Heimberg is talking about a lot in his argument. And finally, the elevator talk. My elevator talk, I kind of size up which of the three points, but uh, public power is affordable. In Syracuse, I say, we can solve it, depending on what quarter what we are. It gets their attention. Uh, clean and green. Uh, we have no power under New York, you know, the way it's organized. They, they so-called deregulated to create a market to reduce costs. But what they got is a duopoly selling us the coal and natural gas. And then there's some nukes. And that's the market. And we've seen, you know, J.P. Morgan Chase just got caught gaming the system instead of the independent operation. It's complicated, but they basically rerouted the, the electrons through a bunch of states to get tariffs when they didn't have to. So it's just like Enron was doing in California during that mm -hmm. brownout, blackout back mm -hmm. several years ago. So um, it, what it really was about was bailing out companies like Niagara Mohawk, which not building Nine Mile 2, they, they had $2 billion in debt they couldn't pay, they're about to go bankrupt. And they had $3 billion, they had bought, Mayor Cuomo set up this thing where if you set up a co-generation with gas, um, you get a fixed price. And it turned out they bet wrong. And because the other things were cheaper, those gas plants were costing them a lot, and they bet big on it. So they were $5 billion in the debt, and we paid us NIMO rate, rate payers, and then after grid rate payers for 10 years with higher rates. That's why in Syracuse, I ran for mayor, and I kept raising this issue, and I kept pointing to Salve, and pretty soon the Republican Democrats are saying, wow, yeah, if he's right, we better look into that. <laughs> they didn't really mean it, but, because they didn't want to take on Nymo's headquarters in Syracuse. It's this, I call it the Superman building, you know, this art deco. You expect Superman to come flying around the, around the building in a minute. But, um, and, you know, so it's a major employer and big in the power structure, so they really didn't want to take him on, but the people really demanded it. Um, so, cost. If they're climate justice people or climate action people, clean and green, well, if we got the democratic power, then we have the power. The other thing I was getting at, if you have public power, they aren't separating generation from distribution. The public power system can generate and distribute. So we have control over what kind of power we generate. So, you know, Salve, for example, which is this is little industrial village, is doing solar power stuff and uh, in addition to importing the hydro. So you've got the power to do that. So um, with any net income you generate, you could use it for efficiency or renewable generation. Um, 
And then this is a big one, just being responsive. You know, the, the North Country uh, you know, Power Authority was largely because of that ice storm where they were out in the middle of winter six weeks without electricity. It just, I mean, it, that was years ago, but they're mad as hell about it still. Um, and then if you're in the city of Syracuse, you used to be able to go to NIMO offices and talk to somebody. Now you've got to get on the phone and navigate this phone tree and then get somebody who can't solve your problem anyway. So customer service. The uh, municipal <coughs> utilities are much more responsive. So um, that's my elevator talk. You know, it, it depends on what they, the responsiveness, green, and affordable. A couple more questions. Colin? All right, so Colin, you want to start out? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, if somehow there were to be any kind of uh, proposal, like uh, we just had some ballot initiatives and things like that, um, do you guys think New Yorkers are smart enough to approve, uh, you know, democratized uh, or socialized uh, energy authorities? Yeah, you didn't really talk about nuclear power, and I'm hoping you don't consider nuclear to be green. I know unions are big on nuclear power because they've always seen it as a source of jobs, but I think we've really got to fight against that. And especially, like last week, I noticed there was an op-ed piece in the New York Times where they were really promoting nuclear power and saying how you know there's really not that great a risk with nuclear power, and it really is the way to go. So I think that's going to be, uh, I'd like to know what you're thinking about that. In the back? Yeah. Two questions. What are, are you familiar enough to comment on businesses like Solar City, which seem to cherry pick um, people's houses and put in um, solar heating on their roofs, but they own the system, so people are indebted forever to a company? Uh, the second question is I just got a Washington Spectator. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But it had an article about um, Warren Buffett and is planning to ship coal through rail from Wyoming to, I think it's the state of Washington, and send it over to China. And apparently that's going to have a bigger carbon imprint than um, Keystone is. In a, if you could comment on that, because it seemed to be something none of us paying any attention to and should be. Yeah. Marty? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I don't know. Um, the, the nuclear power issue, if anybody was trying to watch CNN this week, I'm afraid there was a Pandora's promise yep. about all these environmentalists. I was Kieran Lady, I'm sorry if I missed it, but there, there's all these environmentalists that are now pro-nuclear. Yeah. And I couldn't watch it. I, I, I sometimes try to watch these things to, um, uh, to, to get this perspective, but I just wasn't in the mood. Um, and, and, and of course, it says it does, even though you get to build the plan, you have to refine the thing. No, and and is there is does seem to be is there some kind of push in, even after even after Fukushima, which I, I would figure would kind of put the kibosh on you know. Um, but it doesn't seem. But they, they seem to be making a front for assault right now. I wonder who's funding this or, or or whatever. And another thing is, I believe Tupper Lake. My friends in Tupper Lake have um. Uh, um Community power and then their, their bills are also much more reasonable. Anybody knows about that or not? If anybody's familiar, also, are you familiar with the, anybody familiar with the Dark Web? I guess there's a movie or something about this, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah
vibrant movement to stop the coal export terminals. I don't know if it's going to be successful, but the industry they're seeing, that is their way forward. There's, they've got a lot of coal in the US. There's political problems here. There's potential carbon pricing down the road. Um, cap and trade is possible to imagine that in the next five, 10 years, there will be a, a cap and trade system. I don't think it's likely, but it's possible to imagine it. And they're thinking in the future. On nuclear power, my views are a little bit um, different probably than many people here. I don't think nuclear power has a future, but I would not target the decommissioning of existing nuclear right now. And I think one of the things that Fukushima showed, that when they closed down the nuclear fleet almost immediately, what happened? They imported coal from South Africa and Australia, and their emissions spiked and will continue to go up. So we do have to face some hard choices here politically. If we're like saying, let's close Indian Point because it's a, it's a hazard and something could happen, that's true. But if you close Indian Point and we don't have energy democracy, what we're going to have is you're just going to use more fossil fuels. And the gas industry is going to love it. They're going to say, oh, good, you know, let's have more gas-fired uh, uh, generation so we can get rid of nuclear. Some of those guys would love to see nuclear go off the map. But I think though there is, because my knowledge of nuclear is not very strong, what I do know though is there is some, we should have a sort of a, we should look at nuclear and the next generation of nuclear uh, with open eyes. I'm not saying we should basically embrace it. I don't like nuclear power, I think there's some real problems with it. But we do have to weigh it up against all the other options. And that's what democracy is supposed to be about. If we had to look at all the facts, taken away from the lobbying language of the industry, and say, what, you know, let's get the top scientists in and say, what do you think? Is it really true that the new reactor is going to be totally safe and the waste would never ever leave the facility? I don't really believe that right now. But is it true? We, I think we should, we should um, you know, look into that. On the question of popularity, which, sorry, what was your name, brother? Colin. Colin met race. I, I don't know the answer myself. I think that a lot of it is how issues are framed and um, if, and I think there's so many arguments from the big picture of the climate crisis right down to popular power, right down to the pricing, right down to the profiteering. My, to illustrate a good point, when Sandy came through this region, uh, New York City and the eastern seaboard, utility workers wrote a report about two months after Sandy, and these are the same people who run Indian Point, saying that what had happened is that the disaster was far worse because of privatization and liberalization of Con Edison, that what the company had done is basically had a run it till it breaks policy. If it doesn't, if it's not broken, don't repair it. They raked in, was it Con Edison, the CEO, was earned, earned $13 million last year. The head, of the, the head of the Port Authority earned $300,000. He's got far more responsibilities than the guy running you know, Con Edison. But they locked out the union. Then, when they, when they got the union went back in, arguing against concessions in their contract, they were on a seven-day work week to catch up on the backlog. And they were still on a seven-day work week when Sandy came through, and guess what? They were on a seven-day work week again, and they brought in 4,000 mutual help workers from other utilities around the, around the Northeast. Some of these guys didn't even know where Brooklyn was. They didn't even know anything about the industry. So the, U the union wrote a really powerful in uh, indictment of how the privatization of uh, Con Ed and the marketization of it actually made the situation worse. And that, I think, is what people also will respond to. The climate and the environment arguments are important, but they need to be put in the context of other arguments about service and cost and other, other things and democratic control. So I think there's potential. Certainly, last point, in Germany, 40 major cities now have remunicipalized power. And that came out of what they called the prosumer movement. People were buying up solar PV, taking advantage of the subsidies called a feed-in tariff. Some of you may know this. About 20% now of, fuel, of energy now, power generation, is renewable. And there's 700 renewable energy cooperatives. So this provided the platform, which then people said, well, why then, why don't we take over the municipal, why don't we remunicipalize power? And that's what's been happening. Even quite pragmatic, hard-nosed, somewhat center-right people in Germany are advocating it because it makes sense. So I think we have to. We saw and we're seeing in the U.S. signs of that community-based uh, take back 
of the energy system. And I think that's the sort of local campaigns that would resonate and set the stage for a bigger national debate about energy transition and energy democracy. Yeah, that's the responsiveness issue in the elevator talk, because uh, munis have a much better record. And because they keep the staff right there in the community, they know the quirks of the distribution system. You don't have people, that's what they're trying to do now in the name of efficiency is cut the utility work and send them where they're needed. But if you're not from Brooklyn and you don't know the squirrel fried the transformer, you know, and it's and, and, and you got it working again, but it needed to really be replaced, you know, somebody working there knows that right away. Somebody who comes in from outside takes them a day to figure it out. So that's, you know, one argument for having, uh, you know, staff, people that work the lines in the system who know the system and aren't just being running around uh, coming up because every these systems are quirky where they're you know at the distribution level and I know I've talked to IBEW you know that organizes the utility workers they they hate working for national greed they like working with the muni munis partly because it's their community they want the electric system to work they want to work safe uh, it's a much better relationship um, did you mention Buffett Olds, Olds Burlington no. uh, railways I mean he's got a vested interest in shipping coal um, the solar leasing thing, I think it, it obviously depends on the terms. I don't know the company you referred to, um, but I will say that uh, people say, well, we're so far north we can't get solar. Sean alluded to this. Um, I've talked to solar experts that say we can do better in Syracuse than they can in Arizona with solar because uh, they get all that sand and grit and the, and, the, and the solar equipment wears out faster, so it actually costs more when you include the capital costs it generates solar power in Arizona than it does in Syracuse, which is, you know, it rains up there every day. So, um, on the nukes, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm from clamshell eyes. I want to shut them down. I recognize the problem that Sean's talking about. That's why we need public power so we can debate. Because there is a transition, you know, and, and you've got to make some, you got to time it. You know, so they say it's not one or the other, but it's how you time what your priorities are. And that's something we need to talk about. Um, I will say that, you know, one strong anti-nuclear ally that I know some of you knew is Tony Mazaki, the oil, chemical, and atomic workers. And Tony's attitude was, oil is dirty and toxic, atomic is radioactive, and chemicals, we don't know what we're working with. You know, we need to transition ourselves out of these dirty industries. So, you know, Tony was working with Nader on the OSHA and EPA and um, trying to clean up and had, you know, he was ahead of the environmentalists on a lot of these environmental issues. And, uh, you know, so I think you can, you can work that within the labor movement if, it, if it's done right. And, um, you know, I was two years ago asked by some SNCC people I've known for a long time, kind of my older brothers and sisters in the movement, to come down as a clamshell person and talk to them and what meetings they organized about these subsidized nukes being built in Georgia and South Carolina and threatening other parts of the South. Because it's so undemocratic down there, that's where they figured they could get the nukes started with federal subsidies. Wall Street wouldn't invest, but with the federal government guarantee and their loans, they think they can raise the money. Plus, they do construction works in progress, which means you pay for it before the thing's online and you know it works. We knocked that down in New Hampshire during the anti-nuclear fight there. You know, those old Yankees, they were Republicans, but they weren't paying for something until they knew it was working. We took that to town meeting, and there were like 350 towns, and it passed in all but two of them, you know. So, you know, we, we had a good discussion on that, and uh, it's an environmental justice issue down there because they're putting the nukes in, you know, black belt, you know, counties where blacks don't have that much power in South Carolina and Georgia. Um, now, the pro-nuke envir environmentalists, we know who they are. It's that guy Moore that claims to have been a Greenpeace founder. Uh, Harvey Wasserman's written about the real story there. He's getting paid. The nuclear industry's got him. And then you got some people that are just kind of uh, fad, you know, they follow the fads, like Stuart Brand, you know, the owner of Catalog Guy. Now he's a pro nuke environmentalist. Um, you get down to the real arguments with them on costs. I mean, I, I think Sean's right. Economically, nukes are not viable. Um, in terms of getting non-carbon energy, forget the carbon used to produce and build the nuke and extract the uranium, but, and then transport fuel and all that. Um, just the cost and the time it takes to build, they won't come online fast enough, and the costs are enormous. It's, you know, the new generation of nukes were supposed to be three to five billion, now they're priced 10 to 12 billion. The ones they're building are coming in 15 to 20 billion. 
that's typical in that industry. So um, it's it's you know it's like Amory Lovins had a good phrase he was using since the 70s. You know, trying to boil water with nuclear power to get you know steam and generate electricity is like like trying to cut your butter with a chainsaw. You know, it's overkill. There are lots of ways to boil water. We don't need nuclear power. Um, and then New York politics and how you know we can move forward, referendum or whatever. Um, when you set up a municipal uh, power company in most in the most city and municipal charters, you've got to you know do a referendum to the people. In some cases, like Syracuse, we have grandfathered in from the very first charter the right of the city government to say we want to take over the system, and if we can't agree on price, there'll be a three judge panel appointment to set the price. So. We can do that now. They, you know, if I was on the council, I would probably say, let's take it to the people and have a real mandate and make sure everybody understands what we're doing. Because you get in a fight with a big industry like that, they got a lot of resources to fight. So you want people to be on your side before you get into it and understand what they're getting into. Um, but I think in New York State, what we need to do is get this model legislation from 1974 in the congressional record that uh, Lee Webb and Jeff Foe. Lee Webb, I don't know what ever happened to him. Well, actually, he's in Maine. Jeff Foe, you may know, he writes for the American, Pro American Prospect. Yeah, yeah and, you know, I've seen him. Uh, I saw him review his latest book. He, he, he projects that American workers' living standards are going to decline another 20% in the next decade. And he's sitting there next to Trump and all the NFL people, you know, basically reviewing his book. But, you know, he's, he's, a, he's consulted with, you know, the Democrats and the labor movement for a long time. He was co-author of this thing, but I would, you know, I think we need to dust and update this and, uh, you know, make it something we campaign for. Let's democratize NYPA and implement the Jacobson Energy Plan through public power and make it an issue and make it, a, you know, an election issue. You know, the governor's up for re-election. Not only did he, is he screwing up the North Country Power Authority, he, he stuck the bill to us for life, life he was long on the Power Authority. Um, so I think, you know, there are issues we could raise. And uh, you know, get the discussion going. Get the debate going. It's half the battle. I have a few question on that. Um, you're talking about statewide legislation, or you're talking about regional or, or um, municipal? Jurisdiction? I'm saying we can do both. In your own community, if you're municipal, you know, make sure your municipal power company is democratic and you know, moving toward renewables. You've already got the power to do that. If you don't have municipal fight for municipal locally. You can organize campaigns. Um, and then at the state level, we should have a model state, uh, you know, public energy act. What are they, I forget what they call it. Yeah, model state energy act. And and make it a campaign issue in the governor's race next year and, and state assembly races. And, and, you know, get it down to a slogan and then you got a paragraph explaining it, the elevator talk, and then you got a position paper for the wants they want to see if this will really work. And educate and agitate around that. In the back. Yeah, this is such a huge question that you almost don't even know where to start with it. But I've been employed for 27 years by National Grid and, um, well, formerly Niagara Mohawk. And so I'll just start with this one little story. The other day in the mail, um, we all received a hardcover book, unsolicited, with glossy pictures about, and it was titled Unprecedented, and it was a book of glossy pictures of the recovery effort uh, in, of uh, from Sandy. And so I was pretty horrified. And when I went to work, you might be glad to know that every single person was absolutely outraged that we received this hardcover book in the mail, unsolicited. What did this cost? We feel like we should ask what it cost. And one co-worker said to me, they got every VP they could find in those pictures. Well, I worked that storm, and the only time I saw any one of them, you would think he was traveling with the who. <laughs> so there is great frustration within the workers with the whole structure of National Grid, and it's a very sad commentary when you're lonesome for Niagara Mohawk. So, <laughs> so I, I, but what I want to say in addition is that just like the public, workers are in a bubble with this very complex 
industry that we just really don't even, we know what our function is. National Grid does not do the generation, it is now just relegated to pipes and wires. But we don't, you know, where that, what is this Public Service Commission supposed to be? I mean, what kind of public access do people have to this and why don't we you know, not only protest against National Grid and what, what, who are these overseers that are supposed to be doing a job in the name of the public, which are doing nothing. They're doing everything in the name of the stockholder. And I guess my, because of that complexity, Howie, I, 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 I guess maybe I'm just looking at municipalities, little places like Combos that have this, that have a hydro, a functioning hydro that is in the name of Entergy or whoever the heck owns it now keeps changing hands. But, you know, why doesn't the hose own that thing and why isn't that a movement? Green Island you were talking about, and they do own their, they own their single phase residential power, but they don't own the three phase power that's still in the, in the hands of natural. But you go to that, to that little town of Green Island and it's a tight, it's a working class town, but it's a tidier, little mm -hmm. functioning little town. It's not all junk and garbage and, you know, things are working. They get their garbage picked up and they do. So anyway, I, I guess I, I don't really formulate any kind of question except to tell you that the workers are very frustrated working for National Grid, that we can't get there from here. And we consider it at this stage a victory, a, a labor victory, when we get our contract extended. Yeah. So we think, yay, we don't have to negotiate with those people. But how can that be? We turn the lights up. How can we be on the run? And we are, contract after contract, we're getting lost. How can that possibly be true? They cannot light up this place without us. And yet, we're on the run. So. I guess that's not really a question. Well, I think there was there were, there were definitely some things to address. Anybody else before? Well, I would say, you know, to women working for National Grid, that's kind of what I hear from IBW people when, you know, the state fair, Labor Day parade, you know, we're talking after the ceremony and um, they talk about how their members who are organized in the municipals, they feel like they're responsible and the city wants them to be responsible. And it's very different than working for National Read, as we say in Syracuse, because uh, there people just feel jerked around. And, uh, you know, they, they keep cutting staffing to perform the same work. And, uh, you know, there's the contract issues. So, it's complex, but on the other hand, the people doing the work, like you said, they don't want to keep the lights on. If they just let keep, you know, management out of the way, we could get it done. I mean, I've been on a lot of jobs like that. Um, the, the remark about the vice presidents, boy, that sounds familiar. Um, I know in Syracuse, we, we have a woman who now is a vice chancellor at Syracuse University who retired at 50 with an $8 million golden parachute from Niagara Mohawk for being a, you know, I don't know what she was, a high executive officer. And now she basically is uh, planning the gentrification of downtown Syracuse and another neighborhood adjacent to it. Um, you know, I wish she'd just take her money and leave town, you know, go to Florida or something. But, you know, we paid for that and it doesn't seem right. Um, does anybody want to address the, the question of TSC, the Public Service Commission? Oh, yeah. There was a uh, Nader type organization called the Public Utility Commission that uh, was funded by ratepayers. You could do an optional ten dollar check off I mean, and the money. Citizens Utility. Yeah, that's what I mean. Cub. Cub, right. Yeah. I got it. Okay. But that's that's what I'm talking about. And Pataki, his during his administration they got rid of it. That enabled us to hire um, through that organization, you know, experts and lawyers to go speak for us at the Public Service Commission. Um, I think that's something worth, you know, doing, bringing back, although I'd rather have us, you know, focus on public power um, so we have a direct, you know, line to the management, you know, a democratic structure in which to participate. 
the regulation of private industry is, you know, you got your little public advocates against these big corporate lawyers that got your money fighting you, basically what it is, and they got a lot more of it. So even even though that's an unbalanced fight, and um, it gets really obscure. I mean, it is, the regulatory stuff is really obscure. Um, I don't know if you've ever looked at the testimony and the, um, the way those, you know, rate hearings and so forth go. It's uh, it's a full-time job just to try to understand, you know, what's going before the commission. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I used to participate in public service commission hearings in the 1980s. Each April, they had the Mohawk apply for a rate increase, and then each year, in February or March, they would get one. And they applied for one six or seven years in a row, and they were applying for it because nine mile two cost estimates were increasing from $2 billion to $6 billion, and nine mile one was 15 years old and it was running into lots and lots of repairs that they hadn't planned on. And um, it was an unbalanced process then, but at least Niagara Mohawk was a company that operated completely in New York State. So the state had a vast amount of regulatory control over it. Same thing with New York telephone companies that operated in New York State. Now you got Niagara Mohawk as part of an international corporation, and, and, and New York telephone is part of Verizon now. And it's way more difficult for the state to regulate these things because the, the companies operate on such a vast scale. And plus, the, the Public Service Commission back then, they used to have a system of where the, after the company applied for a rate hike, the, a judge would be assigned and then there'd be a meeting where we would set the schedule for the whole year for the whole case. So I could predict when things were going to happen and set my work schedule to work around it. I mean, it was pretty much a full-time job to do that. Nowadays, they they have these rate cases, and, and then they um, the company proposes to settle it, and uh, meetings are scheduled on short notice. There's no stenographer at the meetings. There's no press at the meetings. Everything is in secret now. You know, they basically they changed the system because I was actually fucking it up for them because I was going all the time and getting a lot of press and embarrassing them in the press during the 1980s. And, I was like the only person in New York State that was actually doing it because I was I was paying myself. Nobody could control what I was doing, and, and they didn't like that, so they had to change the damn rules. John. Yeah, just a, a comment, a couple comments. Um, you mentioned Warren Buffett and his coal trains. I don't know how many people know that, you know, because of the tar sands, Bill Gates now is a controlling interest in uh, Canadian National, the largest railroad in, in Canada, which is running oil trains around the clock. Um, and a lot of them are coming right down here to Albany. And they don't crash. And they all, nothing ever happens, right. They only burn up a town once in a while. Um, although that wasn't Canadian National, that was a spin-off, which benefits, spin-offs, spin short lines benefit the majors because they're not liable then for what happens when they burn up a town. Um, but Sean, that video you, sh you had on your Facebook yeah. is awesome. Uh, it was done obviously very cheaply with model trains and little dolls and stuff. But it was, it was, you got to do the same thing on this issue. I mean, I so. a minute and a half, boom! You know, they got through every every point that they wanted to make, and uh, it's a model really to use. I think it was, you really got to work on that. Yes, yeah, it would be good if we could do that. It's really, really simplifying. Can I yeah. just comment on this complexity question? I share what Nancy said. I think that. Um, one of the things I think we're struggling with is that it, it is not easy for people who don't have an energy background, who don't work in the industry, don't have a pretty uh, predisposed towards scientific data. It's very difficult to sort of know how to really get involved, right? And sort of even understand the complexity of, of the energy system and what we would need to do. I think it is a challenge for all of us. And, and it's much easier to sort of go towards things like you know, human rights issues or international solidarity, because you kind of all know that, that kind of, that kind of gets you moving in a certain way. But I, my sense is that with the climate movement, that we've gone with the younger people active around 350.org and, and you know, the climate justice organizations, they have already begun to make this shift. They've gone from a kind of an emotional reaction against what they're seeing as you know, the potential destruction of the planet in their lifetime, and now they're beginning to think, well, they're getting into divestment. Now they're starting to ask very tough questions about what is this gonna what is this gonna work if we get Evergreen College to sell its shares in fossil fuels, 
then some like you know you know sort of Russian or Nigerian you know speculator is going to buy up the shares and it'll be back in the system. So I think it's a it's a bridge for a younger activists to get involved in some of these issues. And I think if we sat and put our heads together on how to build a campaign towards remunicipalization, really got the messaging out in this in the way you know that can be done. And I think the Boulder, Colorado victory the last, in these last few days was really just a few people got together and said, let's take over our, our, our energy system. And they fought off a major cor corporation. I think the vote was like was something like three to two or, or three to one. I don't know what it was. It was a big victory. And if, if some young, inspired people who decided they wanted to make it happen made it happen, I think there's potential for maybe other victories down, down the road. But it does, I think, take all of us having to engage in and have the patience to really work out what we need to do and find the right targets. That would be my sense anyway. Thank you. Yeah, I think, unless we've got one last question. Um, I guess I want to know what the question is, uh, oh, so there's, there's like groundworks in here to lay out how to prevent it from just becoming public but essentially running according to corporate principles and making it democratic is... If you go to the... It sounds like a hard one. <laughs> yeah, there, there were... I, I referenced two books that are on my website. You can, you know, get all the, the full title and, you know, who published it in the year. Um, one was called uh, New Energy. The other was called Energy Efficient Community Plan. And there are two versions of the same model, a little wrinkle in the second one. The first one came out in 75, the second one in 79. And they talk about, remember the six principles I read about, you know, uh, related to democratic control and least cost and, you know, natural resources or the commonwealth um, and transparency to preserve democracy. So that's like sort of the mission type statement. And then the structure is democratic. The local boards are elected, so people have to, you know, face the public, say what they're going to do. Um, again, that's no guarantee. People can sleep through elections. One of the things we found when we did the uh, anti-nuclear fight in New Hampshire was somehow the public service company, which built the new, like the new costs 10 times more than the whole company, the company's assets. You know, Wall Street was really running this thing. And then they got the New Hampshire Electric Cooperative, which had been set up under FDR. To, the, the IOU wouldn't go out to the farms, so they set up a cooperative to cover the farms. And then, the, you know, the farmers kind of stopped paying attention. The cooperative got run by management, and they they call meetings and not really notify people, and just it became clubby and management, and that relate to management and the IOUs. So they were invested in the new. So, but the farmers were able to organize in the rural people and get control of their cooperative again. So you always have that capacity or that right if it's structured that way. Um, so I think, you know, that's, in the end, uh, you know, what's, what's uh, somebody said, uh, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. You know, you got to stay on top of things or somebody, you know, who's hustling is going to, you know, try to, there's a lot of game out there, and you know they're going to use anything they can, and even if it's to put a democratic structure to sleep. But at least then you got the right. You know you don't have that right in national grid. You know you have the right to participate in a public service commission farce. You know that's all we got. So it just changes the terrain in which these things are worked out. Did you tell us your website address? HowieHawkins.org. And then that, that'll get you to the campaign page. Just go to the tab that says position papers. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be tabs there, and the first one's socialize the energy sector. And under that are all this material. Okay. Ways you can get it, uh, either by clicking or copying. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the yeah, it's actually energydemocracyinitiative.org. And there's a lot, quite a lot of materials up there. There's also an e bulletin that comes out every four or five weeks with news from around the world around democracy and energy struggles and climate change. So that's energydemocracyinitiative.org. Visit, and if you want to sign up for the bulletin, just fill out the little you know, name and address thing on the right, and we'll make sure you get on, on our list. It goes to about a 1,000 union decision makers, leaders, and staff around. It's pretty much a union thing. 
but it's uh, no problem if people want to be part of that conversation. Give one last round of applause for our speaker. Thanks, thanks again, everybody, for coming. Have a good night.